to be giving a talk about the tunnels <coughs> on Barry New Road. Am tunnels right? on the Barry New Road. Real ones. Joel. Before we start, can I just hand out some of these handouts to pass round? We'll take a, there's only got a few, but can you pass those round, please? And these. They're pertinent to the talk for later on, so just have a, have a look at them. That's another lot of different ones. Cheers. I'll just give you a minute to look at those. Okay. Pardon? I'll tell you at the end. <laughs> Has everybody had a look at the pictures? Well, I them off, yeah, so I feel yeah, like yeah. right. That's one of them. <laughs> so there's two, two photographs going round. And there's a, there's a third one which can be revealed at the end of the talk. Ooh, surprise <laughs> one. Has everyone seen them? If you've got a copy, just pass them about. Okay, right, I think everyone's seen the pictures, so it's okay to start. Yeah. Right, okay. I did a video years ago called The Last Pit in the Valley, and how I started it was this. This is a lump of coal. And not a lot of people know about coal now, do they? In the digital age, you know, we just put the light on it, it appears a power. So this is a lump of coal which we all use. This, this brought us into the world. This powered our hospitals, powered our industries. And that's what it is, black gold. So I worked at Hitchcock Colliery, which was not far from here, just a couple of miles over there. And that's what it was 30 odd years ago. Of course it's gone now, it closed in 1989, 90. And I used to go to work every day under tunnels under Berry New Road. So the pit had numerous tunnels. First of all we had districts and we had what was called a take. So the take was where you got your coal from. That was your geographical area where you took the coal from underground. So the take for Agecroft, we had two, two sectors, a southern sector and a northern sector. The southern sector went to Worsley, Eccles, that area, stretching from Monton right down towards the old, old hospital and all the way around there to Worsley. And the northern sector, which I'm talking about, went to the north, obviously, towards Simister, Presswich, Whitefield, even I Broughton, Kersal. And we had tunnels that went under Berry New Road to get to the, to get the coal, particularly around Eaton Park, Prestwick Chills, places like that, and all the way up to Radcliffe and Outwood. So every day I travelled them tunnels, because we hear a lot of stories about the tunnels and the uh, myths of tunnels under Berry New Road, but these were real tunnels. And first of all, we dropped 2,000 feet down to the pit bottom, and then we get on a little train and go and get the journey to begin to get the coal. We'd get round towards what we had loco, loco depots. We had little trains, like little, little, they were called paddy trains, allegedly because a lot of Irish people worked in the mines, which they did. And we'd go for about half an hour on the locomotive underground. And then we'd get to a destination where locomotive shops were. And then we'd get off the locomotives and we'd march to our places, our districts, our districts of work where we'd worked. We had about 14 seams at Agecroft, so there's numerous districts. When I was there, there was about seven districts. I worked on D5s, which standard for Dow, Trencherbone, and numerous other Rams, Rams seam, Bin, Bin Mine, all different seams. So you had different developments, tunnels going here, there, and everywhere. We had something like 25 miles of walkable tunnels from Agecroft in the northern sector, which is quite a lot of walking. And plus they were on a dip, a lot of the tunnels were on a one in two dip, or a one in two tip down, so the seams were in a horseshoe shape. So they weren't straight, they weren't horizontal. Because the reason we could go on the train, because it was on what was called the horizon, so it was flat. So the train could go along and then it would get to a dip. And that's it, you know, so. And of course we had three faults as well in the area. We had the Pendleton fault, which everyone knows about, the Bradford fault and the Ardwick fault, and numerous other frishes. So, do you not even know what a fault is? What it actually does a fault? How it, how it forms? If you imagine you've got two 
sort of equal strength rocks going together like that. One's got to give, they're pressing all the time. So it'll either go upwards or downwards with the pressure, like magnets, you know, one goes in one way or the other. So the fault, the pendulum one goes down like that. So that's where you've got your fault, and it's always rumbling all the time. And that was the major fault, it's something like a thousand yard drop. So we had to negotiate that as well and go through that one way or another, which split the coal seams. And then we'd get the coal, and what we'd have with the tunnels, we'd have, when we went in, we had what was called the, the, the tailgate. That's where all the men went in, the equipment, the trains. And then we had the main gate where all the coal went out and all, all the men went out. You see men on man riders when they got the man riders to get out, because it would have took too long to get out and go in as well. You're talking about two hours travelling time. So that would have been off the shift, so we had to uh, get out pretty quick. A lot faster than when we went in, that's for sure. So we went under the areas of, in an arch from High Broughton here. I'll just speak about the first bit and Andrew Knowles, who was a colliery owner. You know about the landslide, the landslip, and how it happened, and it's all shored up now. It's in the 20s. Apparently that was working from Agecroft Colliery that caused that, underneath it, because the ground above it was unstable. Sandstone, bunter, clay, and, and he shouldn't have gone under there. But there's a good piece of coal under there, a lot of coal. So Andrew Knowles went and got it. He told him not to do it, and he caused a landslide. That's why the landslide happened. It was unstable ground, and he dropped it down. But he never admitted it. But year, when I was at the pit years ago, I was in the map room when it was closing, and I found some documents. And he actually admitted in the documents that it was Age Cup College that did it. If he'd done that in the 20s, he'd been bankrupted. I wish I'd have kept that, I, they all had to be handed. I don't know where it is now, but, you know, he got away with it, basically, you know, and basically pulled down the half of sulphur with it, plus other things he must have got up to. So, starting from the arch there, the Hcroft Colliery Northern Sector went all along, basically, very new road, was sort of like a, a dividing line for some of the seams. Eaton Park, there's a pillar of coal there, and we... Had to have a pillar of coal over certain buildings, obviously, so they didn't subside, because it caused a lot of subsidence and a lot of um, collapses of housing. So to stop subsidence, what we did was, when the face advanced forward, the roof used to fall in, hopefully. If it didn't, we had a chasm. And then you get your expression, then shut your gob, you really shut your gob, or pack it in. That's where the expressions come from, because you packed it in, so it didn't subside on the surface. You just put dirt in from the work in the tunnels that you were doing to make sure there wasn't as much subsidence as possible. But with heavy buildings, you had to be very careful. So our first horizon tunnels that went from Agecroft to the north, they first encountered the power station. So we had to keep a, power, a pillar of coal there, obviously. Then they went up to our, I've got maps at the end. If you want to look at the maps, I'll show you where they were. But Then we went up, we, we just sort of skipped the power station, went up to our Presswick Chills, where the reservoir is. But unfortunately... Uh, we subsided that and it had to be filled in in the 60s. There used to be a reservoir at the top of uh, Range of Blue. It's gone now. Myrtle Grove Dye Works, we damaged that. Um, numerous other buildings. Uh, and then we ended up to, towards the hospital, Prestwich Hospital. We damaged that as well. We damaged the viaduct at, at the M62, which will come to later. We damaged loads of houses. We actually damaged uh, cottages on Clifton Lane that had been there uh, like from the... 1800s and they damaged them but one of them was owned by a vicar church of england vicar because people got compensated if could prove they were subsidence caused by the mining and he got fortune and went to australia and was never seen again <laughs> just to give it up or something well that was all through us but um you know the 12 arches railways that was owned by british railways at the time near clifton well there was a big fight over that because it started going but they closed the railway down anyway before in 1958 or something so there's a big legal battle over that, and in the end, they just both give up because it was a national coal board against the national coal board, really, the state. So that never got proceeded with. But the, the work is right under there as well, because, uh, like I say, we had numerous different what was called developments and districts. It wasn't just straight in and straight out. You had to go to where the coal was, and that's the best way of getting it. So we went over towards that way to the left, which would be towards Clifton Marina that way. At the point of this, it was uh, we worked basically not under the river very well in it. And all the water, it was a receiving pit from all the pits further up the Irwell Valley. So the water came down basically to the end of the valley here. So when we were working under, under, in the river, we had to wear, we looked like sailors really. That's our western, I was a tunnel at the time. So we used to do the tunnels, a rip off, called a ripper. But it was constantly wet, it was, it was like just being in the river, which we were 
and that, that was just at the start of it and then you'd go proceed further on and then you come to the dips one in two dips and then you do the tunnel and because of movement of the earth with the faults and things like that you could lay a tunnel that flat one day and you could come back and it'd be like that or it'd be crushed in or we could have upheaval so it's a constant f fight to keep them tunnels open all the time it's 24 hours seven you know seven day week you, a pit never shut you know it had to be maintained all the time and cared for and of course we had to have the pumps on for to stop flooding the, we, we got out about 18 million gallons a, a, an hour or something like that it was constantly wet and that went straight to the river real well and came back the outlet pipe for that is near the power station it's still there so then it's a cycle again wet 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 and straight out again so we encountered all difficulties like difficulties like that in the tunnels uh, I remember once doing a job, um, we took the bundles off at the pit bottom and the water just started rising like that. You know, just unbelievably fast. I mean, this is like in a matter of seconds, and the pump started again, it had all gone. So we had a big problem with water and gas, of course. We had methane, so we had to clear the methane by ventilation, pump the water out, and um, go on our merry way in our tunnels. So the districts that we sort of finally worked on, the tunnels went. If you look at the map later, I can, I can show you actually where they went. But the tools went towards Simister, towards Eaton Park Reservoir, up towards Whitefield, and then arched round to Outwood, where Radcliffe is. Stan Lane, round Stan Lane. And there hadn't been much mining done there until we decided to start causing the subsidence. There'd been one, one pit called Stotts Colliery, which was near Park Lane, and that shut in 1902. There was one pit called Black Cat Colliery, also known as Outward Colliery, and that was on Greenwood Close, just off Stan Lane. Well, there hadn't been much ma mining until we stumbled on it into the 60s, particularly my father, he started in 1958 at Agecroft. So that started causing all the subsidence. So all the tunnels that you see, the horizon tunnels, which I'll show you later, they're the two main tunnels, where you go in and you come out. There was offcuts, so crosscuts, we call them crosscuts, into other developments. So you tunnel in here, there and everywhere. Like I say, there's 25 miles of walkable tunnels that gives you an idea of how vast the tunnels were. And there's some tunnels that weren't walkable as well. Walkable means about 12 feet, 10 to 12 feet. Now under Whitefield, where the roundabout is, near Tesco, that was where pretty much where the local depot was. So the train stopped there and it was, it was a vast amount, vast space under there. You wouldn't believe, you know, if you're down there. It's like a little city with low coals. And then we had a massive bunker to collect the coal, then put it on conveys to take it out and get it cleaned and sent to the power station. So there's a lot of, lot of holes under there. You know, it's just absolutely massive holes that, that basically cause a lot of subsidence. So we subsided a lot of streets down near Heaton Park train station. That got damaged a bit. Over near Sheepfoot Lane, Nazareth House was protected. The Longfield Suite was protected. But if you look along Berry New Road, you can see some of the houses sort of lopsided. Hayes Road, Rectory Road. So we did quite a lot of damage, but I don't think any fell in except the ones in Clifton Lane, fortunately. So we, we clipped the hospital, did a bit of uh, damage there, but on the whole, there's a lot, a lot of holes under there that are basically being held up by water. If that water was to go, because water's a solid matter, isn't it? If the water was to drain for some reason, there'd be a lot of drops, you know, hell of a lot. So the water's basically <coughs> keeping half the press reach up, keeping them tunnels up. So. Is that water from the river, it's from the airwell? Well, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's water from everywhere, surface water that just seeps through the aqua, you know, and things like that. I'll, I'll finish off in a minute, you can ask, because it's going to be a lot of questions, I think. But basically, that's where we mined, under that area. And uh, if anybody's got any questions about anything, I think we'd be better off opening it up on this, because I, I could prattle on for ages, so <laughs> I'd rather listen to it if anybody has said anything. So, if anyone's got any questions. So, if, is there a lot of coal still left in age crop or? I mean, was it closed because the coal ran out, or was it closed as a political act? No, what happened? What happened with the southern sector, which went under Worsley? Obviously, there's a lot of rich people in Worsley, and uh, Ellenbrook and places like that, Mont Mont and so they started thinking, oh, we can't be having this, because our big houses might be pulled out. And it was unstable, land was quite unstable there, so I think the coal board were told, right, that's it, no more mining under there. It's causing too much damage, you know, to the posh people in Worsley. Can't be having that. So go north where all the scumbags are. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's all right, it's acceptable, isn't it? So they stopped the mining in the southern sets about 79, 80, 81, that, that was it, sealed up there. So then we concentrated on the north. The pit was reconstructed from an old pit in 1957, 58, resunk one of the shafts. And the coal 
board gave H. Croft Colliery in 1960 a 100-year lifespan. Now, it lasted until 1990, so on the surveyor's report from H. Croft in that area where Whitefield, Blackley, Blackwood, Presswich, probably another 80 years of workable coal there. So it was shot, obviously, for political reasons. Is that annoying? Is yeah, that annoying? Um, I came to live up here in 1956, I think Manchester Street first, and then Higher Broughton in Rialto. And um, we've still got the old ranges from the 1800 house, and we still use it. And what's really annoying is that my grandchildren have got four cars, right? Four cars. We have no cars. But I'm not allowed to have a small fire that keeps us warm in the winter and heats the water. That's really, really annoying. I know it's bad for the environment. And when we first came to Manchester and Salford, everything was a black smoke. You couldn't see for your hand in front of you. People had bronchitis. Nobody had asthma. I can't remember a soul having asthma in those days. So it's the car fumes still all the damage. Why don't they do something about the cars, like Andy Burnham said, and let me keep my coal fires? I've got to have logs at the end of next year. Heaven knows what that's doing to the environment. And the other man, that man you mentioned before, Andrew somebody, who's he? Andrew Knowles. Yeah. Well, he was a notorious colliery owner of the Dear World Valley Pits, so he was a five month particularly in Salford. And what he was, it's a bit of a, it's like a, one of archetypal old mill owner, yeah. do as I say, I'll shed out type of thing. Right. If anybody wanted to start a combine, trade union or whatever, he'd sack them from out the tired houses. Particularly in the 1860s in Bendlebury, Wheat Chief Colliery, there was a lockout there, he basically wanted to start a union, the MFGB. And they found out, and he just threw the lot of them out. He went to Staffordshire and Bilston, around that Wolverhampton, that area, sent his agents down there, brought a load of what they called at the time knob sticks. We would call them scabs. And he basically turfed everyone out on the street, what families a lot. They, were called, they called them locally knob sticks in Pendlebury. Yeah. It means scabs. <laughs> yeah. So, so he, basically, he probably went on to that. Yeah. He started in slavery and then went on to that, yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah. But he just threw them out on the street and put the Staffordshire scabs in their houses. So it led to a lot of ill, Ill will. And, yeah. I mean, I'm a friends of a genealogist, so if anybody comes looking for family history, like, and they say, Where are you from? Your grandpa, not Bilston. Ah, they're not stick. <laughs> <laughs> they, were actually, they actually built streets called the Staffordshire Streets in, in Pendlebury, because you know, it was built for people in Bilston to replace the local population. It was actually murders and fights and riots. And, also, so it's a bit of a get, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Staffordshire Street, because I'm quite interested in street names and uh, the origin of names. And just near here, there is a Knowles Lane, isn't there? You know, Knowles Lane, it goes down to the cliff, it's just near here. So would that have been named after this um, possibly, possibly, Knowles character? Yeah, possibly. The, the, the main streets in Pendlebury that built were, we had Knowles Square, which was sort of facing at St. Augustine's Church, just at the back there, but the sta that was called New Bilston just at the side of St. Augustine's Church, that's how, you know, how it, how it grew, into a little Staffordshire. And then there's the streets further behind the Windmill Hotel, I don't know if you know that, on Station Road, where Lowry Court is, near the mill. That was all the Staffordshire streets there. They've been cleared down. I think they lasted a long time then, didn't it? 60s, 70s. There's, there's, I think Lowry Court's there now, places like that. So, he, he wasn't a nice man, you know. And, and the thing is, his father was Andrew Joel Senior. What he used to do to get labour for the pits, He'd go to the Swinton Industrial School, but the town hall is now the Civic Centre. Well, that was once a workhouse. So he'd get the orphans from there. And if you ever look at the old picture of the, the cages when the kids are going down, they're only about that high, because they're only so high, the kids. You see the kids in the cage. But, I mean, he would have took 10 year olds down there. So, yeah, a bit of a swine. A bit like Black Douglas at Douglas Green. He was the equivalent of, uh, you know, the mines. Steve? Oh, Jim? Yep. Do you, do you know where this uh, Knowles lived, and uh, was he from the local area, or was he somebody who came from outside and developed it because he was richer, or did he grow up in the area, or, or has he got family left in the area, maybe? Yeah, I think he, he started off as a small business colliery in Turkey, following Edgeworth around that area. Started one pit, and then obviously he's made more money. It's around the 1800s, Andrew Knowles Senior, his two. Then he progressed down the valley, so he'd buy a pit near, Fox pit near, right. Farmworth, and he'd proceed down the valley, and he'd buy Wheat Chief. Newtown, and then Agecroft and Pen Pendleton. What he did with Pendleton, the, the man called John Fitzgerald at Pendleton, he founded it, uh, dug it. And George Stevenson's brother was the engineer who worked in there. George Stevenson himself, the rock to railway man, he was a the manager there, and his son was a consulting engineer, Robert. So it's a pretty famous pit, which we're actually doing a monument for now. <laughs> he did St. Thomas's Church. 
So he owned all the pits basically, and he owned the mills, he owned everything, he was like Lord of the Manor. So if you didn't do what he did, did you were out, and it was as simple as that. But they were a pretty big family, obviously they came with power, and uh, how, how they finished up was, because after the First World War, they, they'd lost a lot of manpower, and sort of new mining techniques were coming in, they were sort of basically nearly went bust, they amalgamated into four collieries, four colliery owners amalgamated to Manchester collieries. And then, of course, in 1947, nationalisation, he got paid an absolute fortune for his pits that were pretty much knackered, that needed reinvested in, and the state took the, the one as a national coal board. So he did quite well out of it. In, in his will, he died in 1936, I think. He left about £262,000, which was quite a lot of money in there. Millions, millions today. So. Could Charles Dickens have had hard times, and didn't think? Apparently so, yeah. Well, it yeah. Okay, so you talked about the mining tunnels on the Berryley Road, yeah? We're going to be doing articles about the Jacobite tunnel on the Berryley Road. Could you give us your view on that? Whether there are tunnels, secret tunnels, all on the yes. Berryley Road, right into the cathedral and towns and town square? Alright, well, there will be tunnels and there will be rumours of tunnels. I I mean, I can only speak for the ones I've actually seen and, and actually been through. Now, they might be there, might be, you know, that's up for archaeologists or everybody else to go digging with a spade. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> but, but they may be there, but if they're verified, yeah, but I, these are verifiable. You know, here's the maps here, this, this is living history who's actually been there, but I don't know any Jacobites. So, <laughs> so I don't know. It's all, it's all up in the air, that one, isn't it? That's, that's for the people who write the books, isn't it? <laughs> You used, used to be in Noel's house, I think, on Berry New Road, where no, the car showrooms are now. Yeah, I don't know if that was associated with that. associated? I don't think so. I don't think uh -huh. he was near, a, sort of like the other side of the Weather Height, all sort of East Salford and along the valley, more along the valley. He might have been. I, I don't, I've never come across. It's very large now. Yeah, it was, yeah. Mm. 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 I probably do know Jacobites, you know. Because Salford's a Catholic city. You probably do know Jacobites. I'm only joking. Not like you, Thomas. I haven't myself. Any, anybody else? Yeah, sorry. So the uh, mining museum used to be in the uh, former house, of the, the house of the former uh, mayor of Manchester, yeah, yes. Buellville Park. Yes. Uh, do you know what's happened to the, uh, uh, a lot of the records of local mines and um, maps and diagrams went into that museum? Yes. Do you know what's happened to them now? A lot of, a lot of it just got destroyed. I retrieved these maps I've got here, and I've got quite a few at home. From when, the pen, when, the pen, when the pit shut closed, the map room was left. So I just took them because otherwise they'd been destroyed. Mm. They, when the industry was well butchered, they just flung everything away. Now the, the Beulah Mining Museum went the same way because it lost its funding. Allegedly, that the, the building was unsafe. It's been unsafe for a few years, hasn't it? And we lost a gem. We lost a real gem there. And Salford Council should hang their heads in shame because that should have been saved. And all our industry should have been shaved. Unfortunately, all the records and everything else has you disappeared. You can't oh, save a building. Mean, you should, sorry. You, you can't save a building. You should save the actual. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've got some of the Winter wow. Manchester um, Museum, some of the artifacts. There was also <laughs> a pit pony down yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Pony. Well, basically, a lot of it's been atomized, <coughs> lost, or destroyed, or some stuff has ended up on eBay, and I don't know how it should have ended up on eBay. Because that, that wasn't anybody's property to put on eBay, so I don't know what happened there. But I mean, the big issue there is with equipment, once it goes, people just go in and say, I'll have that. I mean, for instance, Booth Sound Mines Rescue. Do you remember that? Do you remember that in Ellenbrook? Yeah. yeah. People might remember the, the emergency winder that was outside. It was a huge, I mean, it weighed yeah. about 60 tonne. Now, that went to Shatley Whitfield Colliery. I went down there looking for, we've been looking for years for where the stuff went, and that disappeared. I mean, I've, our oh, 60 ton <laughs> emergency wider can go, so if that can go, anything can go, can't it, you know? Yeah. So that's what you're up against. A lot of records just got destroyed. I know at, at the moment, the National Union of Mine Workers headquarters in Barnsley, what we do with their records now, they're, they're in a bit of a mess. They're all going to Warwick University to be uh, digitalised. So that's good, so that's, they're being saved. But like I say, 30 years ago, every coal was finished, wasn't it? Yeah. New digital age and whatever. 
So we'll buy gas off foreign countries and that will pay the price. Can you, anyone else? Anybody else? Yeah, Paul, okay, John. I, I think, the thing I'd say is, you know, sort of talk's been absolutely fascinating. And for the Salford lad, it, it's great to hear and, and that you're keeping that history alive. And, and I think it's something that we should be doing in schools yeah. uh, and yeah. sort of getting young yeah. people to, to realise the history of what we've got here. Because, you know, I was sort of Nigel, the sort of mate from school, um, he, he was an electrician at the pit. No, uh, I was at the power station. Yeah, I went down the pit as a bit from the business. And I just think there's so much history with the pit and the power station that we shouldn't forget it. Yeah. Uh, and I think what you're doing is great. Okay, so we started the Overland Mining project, that's what I'm the chair uh, a few years ago, because there wasn't any monuments or memorials to the pit. So we got a monument at Agecroft. We did one at Clifton Hall, and we're doing one at the moment to say Thomas of Pendleton Pit, which is basically right on Whit Lane in the middle of Salford. We're actually building a banner and all. And we have worked with school children, that's the idea of passing it on because we're not going to be here forever. And I want the monuments up for the future and hopefully for the young people to uh, look after them for the future generations. That's what we're all about, education. It'd be great to be on the curriculum. We've been trying for ages, so it's just a matter of getting it in, but we've been doing it offhand. Uh, it's like the power station there. When the pit closed, it was connected to the power station over there, and we used to send what was called blend there, fine blend. We mixed the coal, and it went straight to the furnace. Face the furnace, that's the way it went. It's the cheapest power station in the country to run, because the mine was right next to it. You no, no costs involved in producing it or anything else. And what happened was when the pit went, of course, the power station went not long after. It became from one of the cheapest to the most expensive. I will have to shut that as well. Now, there was a brickworks facing Hcroft Colliery, Thermalite, and what happened was with the coal was it went to the furnaces at the, uh, at the power station, it was burnt and turned into ash, and then the ash went to Thermalite to make bricks. So you had a triangle of employment there, you know, fa fantastic job for Salford kids. And now what have you got there? You've got a prison. I mean, it just appalls me that you've got a prison where Salford kids, if they've had an opportunity, they, it wasn't a great, you know, it was a dirty job in the pit, but it's great. I mean, you could be like a big kid, you're blowing things up, you're getting dirty, you're <laughs> smashing things up, you're getting wet. It's, you know, it's like an adventure, like, in a way. Obviously with the dangers, you know, but <coughs> wouldn't that have been better for Salford's kids to work in that pit or have the opportunity and work in the brickworks and work in the power station yeah, rather than just rotting a prison? Mm -hmm. uh, it's depressing. But, you had you a know. circular economy, which is, which is very, very good. You had a circular, circular economy, which yeah, is very, yeah, very good. Yeah. And it was all environmentally friendly. Everything got reused, Absolutely. recycled. Yeah. Before it was fashionable to recycle or get sold to do it. We already did it, you know. <laughs> that gentleman's right, you know, Paul, and you are too. That should be on the curriculum. I don't know why everyone's ashamed of being British. British heritage, whether you like it or whether you're not, what came up by slavery or whatever, it should be taught in the schools. It really should. Not just for black children, but for everybody. You know what I mean? They should unite. I mean, you know I'm Secretary of Manchester Council for Community Relations. We're not funding anymore, by the way. All those people get together because we've all got something in common. And we all have got things in common. But I keep highlighting the differences the whole time. I, you know, I said to um, Anne McClan about being British, that that should, should unite you. He said, I'm not British, I'm international. But, but you should be. You should all remember that we're, that we're British, or Salfordian even. Well, I, 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 I think that's what, what, what Thatcherism has destroyed, tried to destroy. Really? And they haven't destroyed it. What they tried to destroy was community and collective mm. help that people had in them days. You help your neighbour, you didn't bat your neighbour, you didn't compete with your neighbour to get on top of them. You help them if they're yeah, on the floor, you yeah. help you pick them up. Yeah. That's the society they've led us to. Yeah. Mind you, you know I knew Tony very well, but he was the one that got rid of the councils, which was a terrible mistake, and divided up people in that Scottish Parliament and and Welsh Parliament, the councils were much stronger. They were always Labour and Socialists as well. But things got done. Salford Council was brilliant when we first came here in the 50s. Brilliant. That was a mistake of Tony Blair's too. I did tell him, mind you, but... I think he, if, you look at the energy, if you look at the energy policy over the last 30, 40 years, since they decimated the, the coal industry, yeah. where we've got a thousand years of known reserves, and we were at the forefront 30 years ago, carbon capture and storage, clean coal technology, yeah. which would have meant we could have cleaned the coal up. It was dirty. We, you know, the NUM never said it wasn't dirty. The NUM never studied the way of progress to clean the coal up and have pits that produced high quality coal. 
It never fought for a pit that was exhausted. It just doesn't make sense. If a pit's exhausted, everyone agreed it goes. But profitable pits for the country that could have given us free fuel today. We could have free yeah. fuel. We've got a thousand years of fuel beneath our feet that we could turn into coal, uh, gas, we turn into oil, we turn into petrol, aviation fuel, plastics, aspirin. There's byproducts of coal. There's hundred ways to use coal. And it hasn't been utilised, and that's what's annoying as well. And look at the state we're in. I mean, look at, we can't even afford our bills sometimes. Mm -hmm. trip. People on meters now are finished. That's the end. The, the winter's coming. And this is what's frustrating because when we went on strike in 1984, this is what we said it's about. Jobs, pits and communities. Now, if people have got to wake up, sure. There's got to be a better mix. You know, we could use coal now. We could use wind power. We could use technology that can keep clean, you know. It's not a problem with that, it's the political will to do it and the vested interest of a few who are taking us to the cleaners basically and profited in our misery and our deaths, let's face it. Well Paul, look at what happened with North Sea Oil, how um, the British Thatcher squandered yes. the profits from North Sea Oil and yet the Norwegians set up a sovereign yeah. fund. Exactly. So the money that they made from their tranche of North Sea oil, they still have and it's ploughed back into Norway, into the people, into yeah. communities. Um, where did ours go? For tax cuts? Well, what for what? what? Short termism. What they did with the gas was obviously tax cuts for the rich of course, because yeah. they always need it, the rich, don't they? They always need more. You know, so they took that off as well, our national asset was given to the rich, you always need more. But the two, we had gas reserves, an off sea gas with 200 year <coughs> reserves. We have massive storage units, we've still got a rough in the North Sea, which is stupidly closed three years ago, and now they need it again. Because we've got no, we've got no strategic reserve of gas, gas, unbelievable. But what they did in the 84, 85 strike, what Thatcher did to break the strike, was convert a lot of power stations from coal to gas. So they squandered that 200 years of domestic use of gas and industry, in what, 10 years, 20 years, converted all the power stations. So you didn't have to burn coal, so they could close more pits and break the back of the union. That's what it was about, breaking trade unionism. I got my coal from Germany, I mine comes from America now, in Germany now. Well, the coal that comes to Britain now is basically lignite a lot of it, dirty coal, brown coal. It's so still mined by Colombian kids. Yeah. They're still mined in places where there's no trade unions, so it's, you know, it's, we're still using coal. Mm. Last year, the coal station at West Burton had to be turned on because the lights would have gone over that, out otherwise. So this year, they're extending the life of the first of the coal stations that left over the winter. But they're doing it on like a six month basis. You can't work your energy policy on that. You know, the task to go nuclear, that's the dirtiest fuel of the lot. Mm -hmm. That's the most expensive. And I'll tell you this, in 10 years, your bills will still be going through the roof because of the profit margin built into the nuclear. So you're not going to get cheaper energy. Mm -hmm. you know? The trouble is when we went privatising all these things, we didn't, nobody put in, all these politicians put out by the convention now, we never put in that the British should buy them first. So we sold everything, like Germany, Japan, France. What we're paying now for electricity, the Germans have got that electricity companies, and they're getting cheap over there, because when there's trouble, you can change to your own, don't you? You your own. But we didn't buy it ourselves, we didn't buy the gas, we didn't buy the electricity, we didn't buy the water. And, and I made a joke to him, the air they did next, and my friend of mine wrote a play about it. We're going to tax the air. Right, I've just been told I've got a wind up. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, yeah. everybody up there. Yeah. Yeah. Finish off on this time with yeah. pictures, okay? Yeah. Right, did you all look at pictures? Yeah. yeah. Right. So you knew what what they were, the pictures. You've got the um, There's a couple here. Yeah. So you saw, you saw this one, didn't you? You saw that one? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Right, and you saw that one? Yeah. What this one was, this was taken at the top of Sheepfoot Lane near the Woodfall. Yeah. Now, under them tunnels and in the ground, the gas comes from the coal seams. It's still, it'll still be coming out the gas, methane, CH4. So what these do, you'll see them dotted around the city. Little boxes like with aerials on. They're all over the place. Sheepfoot Lane, near Nazareth House, Presswich, <coughs> um, all around where the pit was, top of Whitefield near the motorway. These extract methane. These are me methane ventilation. So they take the methane from underneath the ground from under Presswich. So, so that 
you don't go in your kitchen one day and have a build up of gas and blow yourself up. So that's what they're for. So I'm that, not happy now. That's what they're for. <laughs> now, now this one. Now do you remember that one? Yeah. yeah. Right. Here's a story about subsidence, right? Anybody got any idea where that is? I know it's quite hard, but it's any idea? The motorway. No, close. What it is? It's here. Well, you know where that is, don't you? Bessie's. Bessie's at the bar. Oh, yeah. Where the M62 goes under. Yeah. Where Bessie's is. Near the restaurant. Yeah, that's right. So, what, what these do. Opposite. What this is. Opposite. Opposite. Because, opposite. Because, opposite. Because, opposite. because of subsidence opposite. from the pit, when we take that off, when we take that coal out of the ground, it might drop. Yeah. So, all the bridges along the Irwell Valley, they have suspensions put in like our hydraulics that gave a drop of about 10 feet. So if the ground subsided below them, obviously if there's a train on, wouldn't be much good would it if we dropped 10 foot and the train went off, the cars went off. So all them bridges along the Irwell Valley, they've got hydraulic suspensions. So if anything, if the coat, if the bunk, it drops down with it. So there's no movement on the bridge, so that's what it is. So now you know. Ah. I'll finish on that. Thank you. Know. Thanks very much. Brilliant. 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 Can I just, uh, I just want the camera over there. Everybody, you can have tea, coffee, and biscuits. Oh, really? Yeah. The oh, scrubble yeah. on that we have next. But, um, the scrubble on. And if anybody. Oh, crap. If anybody. Brilliant, mate. Not have one of these. Please ask, because we have got lots.